Το spoiler alert βρέθηκε και φέτο στο Comic Dom Con Athens, στην Ελληνοαμερικάνικη Ένωση και το Γαλλικό Ινστιτούτο. Στα πλαίσια της διοργάνωσης μιλήσαμε με τον καλεσμένο Simon Spurrier, συγγραφέα που έχει γράψει για πολλούς αναγνωρίσιμους τίτλους και είχαμε την ευκαιρία να τον ρωτήσουμε για τα προσωπικά του projects αλλά και για τη συμμετοχή του στο Sandman Universe του Neil Gaiman. Hello Simon. Hello. You have worked for, for many different mediums from prose to comics to television. Mm-hmm. And uh, both for big franchises and on creator own stuff. Uh, how does the experience differ from project to project? Oh heavens, it's very different. Um... A lot of writers I know who do some of these things, you know, they do sort of a bit of prose and a bit of comics, they're able to um, change gears quite easily to the extent, so there's a guy called Dan Abnett, I don't know if you know the name, he does um, like 2,000 words of prose first thing in the morning and then five pages of comics in the afternoon, I can't do that, it's, the jobs are so different, the, the joke I like to make is that they're, they're as different as um, being a mechanic and being a racing car driver in the sense that both of those jobs technically revolve around engines, but otherwise they have very little in common. And prose is painful and hard and long and lonely, but when you've finished, you feel better than any other feeling in the world. Comics, because it's so collaborative, because there are so many other moving parts in this machine, you never really feel alone and the feedback is immediate. You know, I write a script, within a couple of days I'm getting art falling into my inbox, and there is nothing better than um, seeing something that previously only existed in your head suddenly appearing as, a, as an image. Um, they all revolve around the creative instinct, but they're such different disciplines that they're really not relatable at all. Ρωτήσαμε τον Σάιμον για το Angelic, που κυκλοφορεί από την Image Comics, στο οποίο μια μεταποκαλυπτική γη όπου οι άνθρωποι έχουν εξαφανιστεί, βρίσκεται πλέον υπό τον έλεγχο νοήμων μεταλλαγμένων ζώων. One of the, the main projects that you have read now going on is Angelic, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, basically uses uh, a tribe of flying monkeys to talk about social issues. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you think that uh, a world populated by uplifted animals gives you freedom to talk about this stuff in a, in a more intimate way? Yeah, yes, I think so. And, and also, um, by using the idea of parable, by, by being able to talk about something without just saying it out front, you allow yourself to appeal to quite a range of different age groups, especially. So, for instance, with Angelic, We wanted to make a comic that was accessible to anybody from the age of eight up to 80. So we want uh, very young kids to be able to read it and just see brightly colored adventure and not worry about the, the, the big social issues going on under the surface. And we want adult readers to be able to read it and know straight away that this is um, a, a, a dissection of religious fundamentalism and <coughs> women's reproductive rights And then there's the, the kind of um, the magic spot in the middle, the sort of 12 to 15 year old crowd, the young adult crowd as, as they're known, who it, it gives us great pleasure because we've seen it happen to know that these are um, children on the cusp of adulthood who are reading about it and intuiting something without necessarily understanding everything that they see. And that's a a spot in the comics readership that I think really needs a lot more attention paid to it. I think that a lot of comics, certainly in the Western mold, uh, they tend to go after the kind of aging superhero crowd who've been reading comics from a very early age and have grown up with them, or the very young crowd who enjoy the kind of you know cute animal comics. Whereas this middle slot that we're shooting for, it seems like a very productive and valuable set of readers' brains to be aiming for, so we're super proud of Angelic. Φυσικά, το project για το οποίο δεν βλέπαμε την ώρα να ρωτήσουμε είναι το Sandman Universe, η συνέχιση του ιστορικού Sandman του Neil Gaiman, που αποκτά συνέχεια με τέσσερις νέους τίτλους από την Vertigo 
ένας από τους οποίους, το The Dreaming, βρίσκεται πλέον στα χέρια του Simon. So, uh, let's talk about the Sandman mm-hmm. uh, what, what can we expect from your running The Dreaming? And uh, by the, the project in general, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I'd like you, I, I'd like you to talk a little about uh, how did you find the experience of working with uh, such an iconic set of characters. Sure. And what does that? Uh, um, I mean, it's a massive deal. It's uh, I grew up with game and comics. You know, Sandman means the world to me. Um, so this all started a couple of years ago when Vertigo was first thinking about doing some more Sandman stuff and um, I don't know much about what was going on behind the scenes but they came to me and said would you like to pitch for one of these satellite books and at the time I was quite um, uh, arrogant, I say at the time, I still am, but at the time I was especially arrogant and uh, my response was no I don't want to do one of the satellite books, I want to do the book, I want to do the main book. And they said something like, um, <coughs> we really respond to your ambition, we'll let you know. And I didn't hear anything for two years and I figured I'd blown it because I had been a little bit too ambitious. And then more recently, um, something must have changed behind the scenes. They came back in touch and said, we're getting this going again. Neil's involved. Neil had produced a, a sort of, um, it was like a starting point. It was like a sort of a set of things that are happening from which stories can emerge uh, and I had been chosen to do the main book, the very thing that I had that I had first pitched to do. So immediately I was blown away. Um, the next feeling was one of deep intimidation because you know, these characters mean the world to me. Um, so I have to be a little careful about what I give away <laughs> because it's, it's still sort of early days. But um, the The main thrust of the first arc is that um, you remember at the beginning of Sandman, the beginning of Gaiman's run, uh, Sandman was kept away from the dreaming. He was imprisoned. And when, evi- when eventually he, he gets back, we realize that it's kind of fallen into ruin slightly because he wasn't there to keep an eye on it. And the effect of that ruination has caused some damage out in the wider world, sort of psychic damage to the, the sleeping human population. Well, we're, we're sort of revisiting that in as much as our story opens with Dream, the latest Dream, who, who is the, the, the child in the, the original Sandman comics called Daniel. So he is now Dream, Morpheus. Um, he's disappeared, or, or not quite disappeared, but he's, they know where he is. He just doesn't want anything to do with them anymore. He seems to have quit. And they can't work out why, and they're going to spend an awful lot of time and energy trying to figure that out and persuade him to come back. But in the meantime, all these characters who inhabit the dreaming, who are uncomfortably aware of the fact that they are they're really uh, figments of the human subconscious, they have no real individual life except that which was given to them by dream. They have to cope with his absence at a time when uh, there's all sorts of other strange phenomena occurring, the, the sky has a crack in it, strange things are emerging, there are forces gathering against them on the outside and on the inside of the dreaming. So it's to an extent it's the story of a, a wild west town without a sheriff and all the people who are left behind having to do something about it. And the, the, There isn't really such a thing as a central character, it's an ensemble piece, but the new character Uh, who I've created is a, a woman called Dora. She doesn't know what she is. She doesn't belong in the dreaming. She just lives there because she doesn't have anywhere else to be. Everybody else is running around in a panic, but she she doesn't trust anyone. She looks after number one. She's quite a, a sort of a sarcastic British voiced character. <laughs> I can't, can't imagine why. But uh, yeah, she's really cool. And she, she has this arc which is all to do with uh, a sort of reluctant revolutionary. She doesn't want anything to do with trying to protect the dreaming, but if she doesn't then she loses her home. So she has to make a lot of decisions very fast. And she's getting caught up in the wider picture. So we've got Lucian, the librarian. He's sort of been left in charge at a time when he's feeling like he really shouldn't be in charge of anything. I got Merv Pumpkinhead and Cain and Abel and Eve and Matthew the Raven 
and some new characters who we're introducing. So it's a, a wonderful, crazy sand pit full of toys um, which I'm being allowed to play with and I'm terrified but delighted all at the same time. Τέλος, μιλήσαμε για ένα επερχόμενο project, το Koda, από την Boom Studios, που διαδραματίζεται σε ένα φανταστικό κόσμο όπου η μαγεία έχει εξαφανιστεί. Coda is, um, it's kind of my new favorite thing. Uh, it's beautiful, that's the first thing to say. So the artist is a guy called Matthias Bagara, who, I think he's Uruguayan, but he lives in, he lives in Argentina, I think. Um, he... Oh heavens, I really struggle to explain what his art looks like. It is as if Mobius had penciled a page and then Frank Miller had inked it. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's it's the closest you can get. Yeah, right? Thank you. Good. I was worried about that one. Um, and he colors it beautifully. And it's it's one of those books where the art is the thing that will sell it because it's mind-blowing. It's just gorgeous. But for what it's worth... It's a story of uh, a sort of post-apocalyptic fantasy world. Um, the simple way of saying it is if... Um, no, it's uh, as gasoline is to Mad Max, so magic is to Coda. So this is a world that formerly ran on magic. It was a sort of uh, World of Warcraft style, uh, Tolkien rip-off world with orcs and elves and dragons and all that stuff. Um, where something appalling happened, a calamity occurred, all new magic has been wiped out, there's no new magic. And so we, we come into this world a couple of years after that cataclysm, where everybody is either scavenging for the last dregs of magic that remain, or trying to set up on their own and start from scratch. And in the midst of all this, our main character is a guy called Hum, because he only ever grunts, he's not, he's not a man of words, he just goes mm, whenever he's asked questions. Uh, he's trying to find his wife. And so there's this massive sort of world-building exercise around him with conflicts and territorial war and uh, world-shaking stuff. And he kind of doesn't give a damn about any of it. He's just on a mission to find the person he loves most in the world. But what I love about Coder is that this very stoic, taciturn guy who doesn't speak very much, he keeps diaries. And he's very expressive and very uh, prolix when he's writing. And so we get to see his innermost thoughts. And we quickly realize that he's kind of lying to himself as much as he lies to the people around him. So yeah, there's a lot of layers to Coda. And um, I love all of them. But the, the first and most immediate layer is that it's stunningly beautiful. And this is not like any post-apocalyptic story you've ever seen. It's um, bright and colorful and full of life. And it's the idea being that when something dies, it's as much a beginning as it is an ending. So the object with Coda was to basically take the entire fantasy genre outside and shoot it in the head because it's tired and it's full of cliches. So let's start again. And what we found was not some mournful, uh, bleak, Mad Max style wilderness, but this uh, exotic, colorful, living place full of strange new forms of life. And yeah, it's stunningly beautiful. I see. That's great. Uh, that would be all. Thank you very much. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.